April 20th, 1945. This episode is a memorial dedicated by Time Ghost Army Brigadier Josh Hamill. More on that later. We've seen large-scale surrenders before by both Axis and Allies sides during this war. And this week sees a huge one on the Western Front. This week, over 300,000 Germans surrender in the Ruhr. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, American President Franklin Roosevelt died, which will have ramifications all over. In Italy, a new Allied offensive really kicked into gear. In the West, the Allies compressed the Ruhr pocket ever smaller. In the East, both Königsberg and Vienna fell. The Japanese advanced in China, but were hard hit on defense in Burma, the Philippines, and Okinawa. But the big news, bubbling under the surface, was the gigantic Soviet offensive aimed at Berlin about to begin. Now, I just did an extra regular episode four days ago on the 16th, which covers the first day of that offensive. If you haven't seen that, then you maybe want to check it out before watching this. Day two is the 17th. As the 17th begins, 1st Belarusian Front Commander Georgi Zhukov sends out 800 bombers to hit the second main line of the German defenses on the Zilov Heights, which he missed on day one. At 10 a.m. comes a heavy 30-minute artillery barrage backed by more waves of bombers. At 10.15, the infantry and armor begin their attacks. They take heavy fire, but the numbers slowly tell in their favor, and by noon are beginning to assault Zilov from both north and south. They batter, and they batter all through the afternoon, and by the end of the day, they have taken Zilov town, and the German defense system is beginning to crack. Think about Zilov. It's important. The Kustrin Berlin Highway runs through the town and along the crest of the heights. So occupying the town and heights would give one an open highway leading right into Berlin. As for Ivan Konyev's first Ukrainian front attacks the 17th, his assault forces go into action at 9 a.m. after a short artillery barrage. Now, unlike Zhukov's, his armor was and is racing forward, trying to reach the river Spree before the enemy can fall back to it. Konyev is even with them, wanting to see them force the river in person. Konyev passed great litters of gutted and burning machines, the forests hiding most of the dead jammed into the small streams and strewn haphazardly across the line of advance. The gaunt frames of tanks and the spiky remnants of guns presented a whole panoply of battle. But the fight was over here. Only the thunder of artillery ahead and the continuous roar of Soviet aircraft reminded Konyev of the unfinished battle as he pushed along the corridor carved out by Soviet troops, the sappers having cleared paths through the spreading minefields. However, he is disappointed to find that his men have not beaten the Germans to the spree, but their defense is not yet coordinated, so the Soviets get about forcing the river without waiting for bridging equipment. A single tank drives right into the water in an area supposed to have a ford, and drives right across. The rest of the tanks follow right behind it, and the German line on the spree is broken by Konyev's armored spearheads with a speed that I don't think we've seen more than once or twice before in this whole war. Konyev calls Joseph Stalin to report his gains. He also reports that since things are going well, he could turn his tank armies towards Berlin through the Tsosen axis. Stalin asks if Konyev is aware that Tsosen is the headquarters of the German general staff. Konyev says, yes, he is aware of that. Stalin says, good, I agree. Turn your tank armies on Berlin. Konyev tells Pavel Rybalko to send 3rd Guard's tank army over the spree through Baruth and Tetlov and hit Berlin's southern outskirts the night of the 20th. Dmitry Lelyushenko's 4th Guard's tank army is to cross the spree north of Spremberg and invest Potsdam and the southwestern suburbs and approaches to Berlin. Now, how do you think Georgi Zhukov reacts to this development? He is furious, of course, but also anxious when Stalin says that Berlin could be enveloped just by Konyev and Konstantin Rokossovsky's front, once the latter begins his offensive the 20th. Well, challenge accepted, let's say. Zhukov orders all his army commanders to the front. He orders all artillery, even the siege guns, up to the first sector. No artillery is to be more than a couple of kilometers behind the units engaged 
in the actual assault. And artillery fire is to be concentrated to support such assaults. They will fight day and night. He demands that all commanders down to brigade level inspect their troops and get local situation reports to bust their asses to get everyone ready before noon the 19th because that's when the attacks are to be renewed. Rifle armies must coordinate with tank armies. Traffic control must be implemented and enforced. They will advance or face extremely unpleasant consequences. Thing is, under the weight of Zhukov's front, the German defense system is really cracking the 17th and 18th. Theodor Busch's 9th Army still holds the Zilov Heights, but his left wing is starting to cave, and his right is now being hit by Konyev's advance, and he can't look for help from Hasso von Manteuffel's 3rd Panzer Army to the north, who personally flies recon over Rokossovsky's front and sees it masked to attack him. He can't send away any force. By the evening of the 18th, Zhukov has units heading for Münchenberg and fighting for Marxdorf and Lietzen and clearing Batslov on the right flank before dawn the 19th. They're cutting into the Germans' third line of defense. On the 19th at noon, the new offensives go off after a 30-minute barrage. Münchenberg falls at 9 that evening. With that and the capture of Rietzen, the German defenses are broken along a 70-kilometer wide front and Zhukov's forces are over 20 kilometers closer to Berlin. As for Rokossovsky's pending offensive, he tells Stalin the 19th that his second Belarusian front is ready to go. That night, led by the Night Witches, Soviet bombers hammer Manteuffel's army. At 6.30 a.m., Pavel Batov's 65th Army fires its guns and lays smoke to begin the attacks. However, initially, the opening barrage was timed for later, and though Batov convinced Rokossovsky to change it, the other two assault armies, 49th and 70th, Stick to the original plan, more or less. Well, Batov's men head for the banks of the West Oder in boats and rafts. And after hard fighting, by 8 o'clock, they attack out from the West Bank into the German defenses. It takes until 1 in the afternoon until heavy ferry crossings are operated and they can bring over some artillery and self-propelled guns. But by the evening, he has 31 battalions across and they have 50 big guns, 70 mortars, and 15 self-propelled guns with them in a bridgehead over five kilometers wide and nearly two deep. An hour-long artillery barrage at 7 a.m. heralds the attack of Vasily Popov's 70th Army. They run into heavy German defenses on the dikes opposite them, but they slowly start getting pontoons in to bring up artillery and are at least across the West Oder. The same cannot be said for Ivan Grishin's 49th Army, whose assault just plain fails. Their opening barrage misses the main enemy defenses completely. So Rokossovsky shifts the main focus of the front's attacks to Batov's 65th Army. They are reinforced today and keep trying to expand their bridgehead. But just this evening, they fight off over 30 German counterattacks as the Germans too bring up more force. Still, their consolidation finally allows them to start bringing up bigger amounts of heavy equipment, and the bridgehead slowly expands. Back to Zhukov. At 11 o'clock this morning, his artillery begins directly shelling Berlin. This morning, his front takes Bernau. His armor is in the northeastern suburbs of the city, and two tank corps are racing around it to try to outflank it from the north. His southern flank, who are having more trouble, still pushes a spearhead southwest past Munchenburg to Furstenwalde, behind German 9th Army. Konyev's tanks are racing up from the south, cutting across 9th Army's communications, taking Beirut at 1 in the afternoon and opening the road to Tsosen. This is not enough for Ivan Konyev, and both of his tank commanders get telegrams from him ordering them categorically to break into Berlin tonight. Zhukov radios 1st Guard's tank army with a similar idea. He tells them, to send the best brigades from each corps with the orders that no later than 4 a.m. tonight to break into Berlin and report it for transmission to Stalin and the press. The race for Berlin is nearing its thrilling conclusion. But the Soviets are still attacking elsewhere this week. On the 15th, they attack German positions in Samland. German Army Detachment Samland has orders to hold Pillau at all costs so that any and all available shipping can take away refugees and soldiers. The Germans do have around 20,000 troops here, which is a sizable force. And though they're outnumbered, for the rest of the week they mount a fanatic defense and grind down each Soviet assault unit that takes them on. A few hundred kilometers to the southwest, Stavka 
has a plan to surround the main bulk of German Army Group Center near the Carpathians to prevent prolonged resistance in much of Czechoslovakia. Andrei Yeremenko's 4th Ukrainian Front begins its offensive the 15th. It's a pretty massive attack, aiming to outflank Moravska Ostrava and take it within three days. But by the end of the week, though they have expanded their bridgehead on the river Opava, they can't take either the town Opava or Moravska Ostrava. And to the south in Austria, after clearing Vienna at the end of last week, the Soviets advanced to hold the line from Stockerau all the way down to east of Maribor, effectively trapping all the German forces in Yugoslavia and Italy. They've also advanced far enough to outflank Army Group's center, which opens the way for a drive on Prague. A couple of weeks ago on the Western Front, the Germans were outflanked in the Ruhr. On the 14th, American attacks towards Hagen have cut the Ruhr pocket in two. Large-scale surrenders of the Germans now begin. Some units can't really even fight any longer. The 116th Panzer Division does not have a single functioning tank left, nor a single artillery shell. Surrenders continue over the next four days. Thousands and then tens of thousands of German soldiers responded to U.S. loudspeaker calls to surrender or simply made for the nearest U.S. unit, white flag or handkerchief in hand. The number of prisoners exceeded all expectations, amounting to 317,000 men, twice the U.S. intelligence estimate. The human herd rolled in, held in POW cages that were little more than open fields with inadequate food and facilities. Rheinwiesen Lager, the Germans called them, Rhine Meadow Camps, stretched as far as the eye could see. The German commander does not surrender, however. Army Group B commander Walter Model has, in the past, acidly complained of Friedrich Jose Paulus's surrender at Stalingrad because a field marshal does not become prisoner, which is basically what he says to the call to surrender from U.S. 18th Airborne Corps Commander Matt Ridgway this week on the 15th. Modell is, however, stunned by the enormity of his defeat and the unpleasant news that the Soviets have declared him a war criminal, specifically for the over 500,000 dead in concentration camps in Latvia and the deportation of like 175,000 people to be slave labor. Now on the run from the Americans with no army, there's kind of only one other way out. Okay, Joseph Goebbels speaks to the German people over the radio every year on Hitler's birthday. That's today. He condemns all those who surrender, like Army Group B, as traitors to the Reich. Goebbels also says of Hitler, we stand by him as he stood by us in Germanic loyalty. He shall remain for us what he is and always was, our Hitler. Apparently, this makes something snap in Model and he explodes. And those are the men one has trusted, blindly trusted, closing one's eyes to retain their trust. I had blindly taken the responsibility for compliance with a soldier duty in a just war, a just war led by those frauds. And how many sacrifices have I demanded from my soldiers only to serve these swine? Well, that's what Robert Satino says he says. Rick Atkinson adds that Moto muses, I sincerely believe I have served a criminal. I led my soldiers in good conscience, but for criminal government. It is hard to think of anyone, actually, who has served Hitler more loyally than Model, or anyone in any army who was as disliked by the men under him. Well, tomorrow, in a copse of woods outside Duisburg, Model will leave his aides and shoot himself in the head. Speaking of war crimes, the liberation of Bergen-Belsen camp this week and Buchenwald camp last week shows the Western Allies the full horror of the German war crimes. The Soviets, of course, have already come across several camps in the East earlier this year. This sort of thing is covered in depth in our War Against Humanity series, but the horror that the soldiers see when they reach the camps bears repeating here. This is a report from the British entering Bergen-Belsen. Over 40,000 men, women, and children jammed into a compound designed for 8,000. Since January, they had survived on watery soup, 14 ounces of rye bread a day, and a kind of beet called Mangelwurzel, normally used as livestock feed. But for the past four days, they had received neither food nor water and were reduced to eating the hearts, livers, and kidneys of the dead. 
Plundered bodies lay in such numbers that it was like trying to count the stars, a medic reported. 10,000 corpses littered the camp. 2,000 lined a pit on the southern perimeter, and others were stacked four deep around the hospital. One soldier recounted seeing a woman squatting, gnawing at a human thigh bone. And the Allied advances in the west continue all along the front from north to south. On the 15th, Canadian troops take Arnhem. The 18th, U.S. 9th Army takes Magdeburg. The 19th, U.S. 1st Army takes Leipzig. On the 18th, U.S. 3rd Army crosses the Czechoslovakian border. On the 16th, U.S. 7th Army reaches Nuremberg, taking it the 20th. The French 1st Army takes Stuttgart that same day. Also in the west, back on the French coast, all week long, French air, land, and sea power attack the German positions at Royan. They finally surrender today. The Allies are also, finally, making good progress this week in Italy. Operation Grapeshot continues. On the 14th, U.S. 5th Army attacks join the British 8th Army ones that began last week. 5th Army advances on either side of the road from Florence and Pistoia towards Bologna. They take Vergato this day, though it's a couple more days before it's cleared of snipers. This is the 1st Brazilian, U.S. 10th Mountain, and U.S. 1st Armored Divisions from 4th Corps, by the way. The armor takes Montepero the 15th. That day, 2nd Corps attacks, 6th South African Armored and U.S. 88th Division, go off. The next couple days, the South Africans grind out slow but steady gains, though 88th is stopped. They get going again midweek, and 91st and 34th Divisions are busy pushing back the Germans on both sides of Highway 65, which is the shortest route to the Po Valley. On the 17th, the Brazilians liberate Montesi. As for the 8th Army attacks, on the 15th, Polish 2nd Corps has reached the Silaro. They take Imola the following day, and they close in on Bologna. Argenta is really the place the Axis will have to stop 8th Army if it's going to be stopped. But it's cleared of Axis forces the 17th. There are no more rivers north of it until the Po. The 18th, 78th Division is through the Argenta Gap, and British 6th Armoured is ready to pass through them and hit Ferrara. If they reach Bondeno, then the enemy defending Bologna will be surrounded. German commander Heinrich von Fiedinghoff has requested permission to withdraw 14th Army to the Po River. But this is denied the 17th, and the wheels are starting to fall off. In 5th Army, 85th Division joins 10th Mountain Division on the heights the 18th. The mountain troops were moving down the Lavino Valley, clearing the heights on both sides as they went. Aware that his front was crumbling, General Steinmetz decided the hell with waiting for permission to fall back. But it was too late. The Americans appeared to be everywhere. Von Wietinghoff throws in his last reserves, but it's too late for that too. And on the 19th, the mountain troops break out into the plains of the Po, though they are savaged by a line of machine guns there. But as the week ends, the advances to the Po River continue all along the entire line, and they are rapid. Somewhere the advances are not so rapid this week is Okinawa. Now, there is another kamikaze attack there, the 16th and 17th. These are the Kikusui raids, floating chrysanthemums, this time concentrating on destroyers. They wreck destroyer Laffy, damage carrier Intrepid, sink a transport and an ammunition ship, and damage another two transports. There will be, in a week or three, a special episode that covers these Kikusui missions chronologically so you can see them all at once and the damage they really do since I don't really have time to go into it all here in the depth that I'd like to. One thing that comes from this raid, this particular raid, is this. Fleet Commander Ray Spruance writes to Area Commander Chester Nimitz. The skill and effectiveness of the enemy's suicide air attacks and the rate of loss and damage to ships are such that all available means should be employed to prevent further attacks. Spruance suggests sending the 20th Air Force to hit the Kamikaze air bases on Kyushu and Formosa to prevent the loss of more ships. Curtis LeMay is against this because it would delay his firebombing campaign of Japanese cities and tells this to Air Force's chief Hap Arnold. This prompts Naval Chief Ernest King to bluntly state that if the Army Air Forces will not support the Navy off Okinawa, then he will withdraw his ships from supporting the Army on Okinawa. That would be an 
interesting situation since the hundreds of thousands of fighting men in the Pacific Theater are being sustained by a miracle of organizational logistics involving ships by the thousands running a conveyor belt of food, ammunition, and water. Even just feeding the men requires 25,000 tons of fresh or frozen food a month and 50,000 tons of dry goods. Anyhow, on Okinawa, the Americans are by now ready to hit the main Shuri defense lines, which are on quite rugged terrain after slowly battering their way across the ridges last week. 24th Corps has 7th Division in the east, 96th in the center, and 27th in the west, and they all attack the 19th. The Japanese defense is the 62nd Division, with 63rd Brigade to the east, and 64th west and center, and well dug in. 27th Division actually launches a preliminary attack the night of the 18th to clear Machinato Village across the inlet there, but the main attacks begin at 6.40 a.m. the 19th. 7th Division attacks towards Skyline Ridge, but they are thrown back. 96th makes no headway, and 27th makes nothing but small gains and fails to break the stalemate on Kakazu Ridge. For the rest of the week, American attacks make minimal progress in the face of stubborn defense. In the north, there are Japanese concentrated on the Motobu Peninsula around the 360 meter Mount Ye. They have some 1,500 men here in the Udo Force in good defensive territory where armor cannot go. On the 14th, the big American assault finally begins by the 29th and 4th Marines. Just to get to the mountain, they have to take several hills and ridges. Though they finally hit the main mountain the 17th, they clear it the next day but nearly half the defenders managed to escape to the north to fight another day, mainly guerrilla actions in the north. Today, the 20th then, the Americans finished the capture of the Motobu Peninsula. Now, on the 16th, U.S. 77th Division lands on Ieshima Island off Okinawa. Resistance by both a few thousand troops and some 1,500 armed civilians is more stubborn than anticipated, especially within Ia Town and around what is called Bloody Ridge. The island and its three airfields will be fully declared secure tomorrow, the 21st, and the Japanese take 5,000 casualties, though there is scattered fighting for a few days after that. 77th then goes to Okinawa itself. On the 18th, Ernie Pyle is killed by machine gun fire on Ieshima. He is, well, was, a very much beloved American war correspondent, particularly famous for his depiction of and sympathy for infantrymen. He has just arrived in this theater after years in North Africa and Italy. The Allied advances in Burma continue this week. 33rd Corps is crisscrossing the country, making what British 14th Army Commander Bill Slim calls Union Jack Sweeps, eliminating the enemy and a bunch of places, including Mount Papa, where the defense was brutally stiff, and Magwe. That's pretty far south, but it might be tougher for them to get any further by river. As for 4th Corps driving for Rangoon, 5th Division reaches Shwemyo the 16th, getting there so quickly that the Japanese suicide squads are still apparently digging in. By now, they're under 400 kilometers from Rangoon. The next major task is Taungu and to try to get there too before the enemy can dig in, because there's an airfield there that brings Rangoon ever more within range. And in China, the Japanese offensive in western Hunan that slowly began the 6th sees the Japanese begin their general advance the 14th. Although there are skirmishes during the week, I'll get back to this in detail a couple weeks from now when there will presumably be heavy fighting. And that is this week of the war. With continued big advances and a huge surrender in the West, big advances beginning in Italy, small gains on Okinawa, bigger ones in Burma, the race for Berlin in full swing, and on the 17th, according to Martin Gilbert, Allied bombers destroy 752 German planes on the ground, pretty much their last air forces, and today is Adolf Hitler's 56th birthday. So what's the birthday boy doing? Here's a piece from John Erickson that tells us, with Soviet shells falling directly and uninterruptedly on Berlin, Hitler emerged from the bunker the afternoon of the 20th of April. It was a bent, trembling Führer who inspected soldiers of the SS Flumsberg Division and the boys of the Hitler Jugend, teenagers who might sob with fright, 
but still fitted their Panzerfaust with determination. Wishing the men and boys well, Hitler turned his back on the daylight and went underground, there to greet well-wishers gathered for his birthday, and then to debate the fate of Berlin in a weird, writhing, hopeless war conference. Ninth Army is facing encirclement. There's a gap between them and 4th Panzer Army that's only growing. 3rd Panzer Army is completely cut off from the main defenses. Konyev is near command headquarters at Sossen, and Berlin is going to be under direct attack within hours, it seems. Hitler orders naval commander Karl Donitz and some OKW staff to head both north and south away from Berlin. He refuses to give permission to pull back 9th Army, though, and instead orders the gaps east of Berlin plugged to rebuild a continuous front. Or, as Ericsson writes, 9th Army was clearly doomed, but the grandiose war games with arrows stabbing the maps and lines coiling round supposed positions where none but the dead now lay must be played out to the end. I mentioned at the beginning that this episode is supported by Time Ghost Army Brigadier Josh Hamill. He dedicates it to his grandfather, Leonard Tabaracci, who was born in 1924 to a family of Italian descent in Chicago. After being turned away from the Navy because he was colorblind, Leonard entered the Army February 22, 1943, and served in the Anti-Tank Company 15th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Infantry Division. His battles and campaigns included Rome, Arno, Southern France, the Rhineland, and Central Europe. His awards included the Bronze Arrowhead Device and the French Forager. During the fighting at Nuremberg, Leonard's company was cited for outstanding performance in action between April 18th and 20th, 1945, this week. The citation reads, Anti-Tank Company 15th Infantry Regiment, commanded by First Lieutenant Merle C. Lindsley, fought its way from the environs to the heart of the strategic city of Nuremberg in a two-and-a-half-day running battle. Numbering only 52 officers and men, anti-tank company fought as a rifle unit against a numerically superior enemy with courage, tenacity, and superb offensive spirit. Although weary from continuous marching and fighting, after two nights without sleep or rest, these infantrymen blasted their way through the Nuremberg Stadtpark, destroyed a heavily manned roadblock, in a spectacular rifle grenade assault, broke through a block of sniper-infested apartment houses and finally reached the massive 11th century wall and moat which girded the old city. They crossed the moat under fire and fought as a spearhead force through the labyrinthine underground passageways of the medieval fortifications, engaging the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand struggles despite semi-darkness and the continuous danger of infiltration and destroying every unit they encountered. Leonard was discharged December 20th, 1945, returned to Chicago, married his childhood sweetheart in 1946. They had three daughters, two grandsons, and two great-granddaughters. He retired to Florida in 1976 and passed away in 2000. I'll leave you with some words written by Leonard's daughter, our Brigadier Josh's mother. Leonard never spoke of his World War II experiences and his other military records are lost, so we have no idea what other services he performed for his country. We do know that he loved his family and his country and that he served it with honor. If you would like to memorialize an episode of this series, you can do so by joining the Time Ghost Army at Brigadier level for one year or by making a one-time donation. You can join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.